April 2nd, 1997. Puff Daddy was topping the charts, the producer of the original Godzilla films, Tomoyuki Tanaka, dies at age 86, and it's the start of the second core of the year. This is a day that will go down as one of the most important dates in all of anime culture. The Pokemon anime started one day before, and we followed the trail of Satoshi, or Ash here in the West, for 26 years until he retires in 2023 as the protagonist. Evangelion Death and Rebirth is in cinemas currently in Japan, and beginning the road to one of the most controversial pieces of its franchise. Slayers is debuting its third season in Slayers Try, arguably the peak of the original trinity of the anime, and a new series out of Tenchi Muyo, Tenchi in Tokyo, is debuting amongst all of it as well. However, amongst all of the anime debuting this season, there's one amongst all of them that, through it all, despite being contained in the year 1997, its cultural effects are still being felt in most anime to this day, and with it turning 25 years old in 2022, it stood the test of time and become a cornerstone of not just its genre of the magical girl and shoujo anime, but become a cornerstone of anime itself, and revolutionize the industry as we know it. Revolutionary Girl Utena, cited as being a deconstruction of the magical girl and shoujo genre it's nestled in, is a 39 episode anime which ran for the majority of 1997, and has proved to have a lasting impact on the genre of magical girls and shoujo anime as it was known at the time. Turning it from the genre which has such powerhouses such as Sailor Moon, Carcaptor Sakura, and even Cutie Honey before it, and recontextualizes what it means to create a magical girl anime. This is the start of a retrospective look on one of the most influential franchises I've come across in my time, not just as an anime viewer, but as a queer woman as well, to discuss the themes, theories, and what have you of each aspect of the Yuzuna franchise, deep dive into its core, and seek to answer a question I've heard many times by people in its community. Why is Utena so important? Because to myself and others that have already been absorbed into this, we can answer it in so many different ways, but it only truly makes sense if you have the knowledge of the show itself and its lore to understand why answering that question is a lot more complex than one sentence or even a long-winded video like this can answer. You need three is what I'm saying to do a proper justice. But in order to answer that question, we need to start off with all good stories do to the beginning, which in an instance like this takes us not to the beginning of Utena's story, but to the beginning of the team that would bring us this story. Be Papas. Be Papas, the collective comprising of anime director Kunihiko Ikuhara, manga artist Chiho Saito, head of animation and character design Shinya Hasegawa, head scriptwriter Yoji Inakito, and overall planner Yuchiro Oguro, was formed sometime in January of 1995, while the collective itself was properly made with its name in February of 1996 as a way for all the members of said collective to create their own stories without being constrained as members of specific studios, and rather allow them to stand out as their own authors behind such a series as what we're talking about right now. And while each member of this collective would go on to be thriving members of the anime scene following on from this, with their works still being seen as some of the most popular of the entire medium to this day, even discounting Utena, it is the only franchise they make that bears the collective's name on it. Aside from World of SM, but we don't talk about that. With that being said, however, each member of the team had their hand in, ha in adding their own specific touches to the series during its creative process, and while you'd think that having five different hands in the pie would end up a complicated mess, one, you've obviously never created anything with more than just one or two people and it shows. And two, that's not the case because Bee Papas had a defining vision that was inspired by the media of the time, of which many people originally cited the likes of the Rose of Vesalius as the primary inspiration behind Utena's original basis. And while it could be easy to just say that was the only thing inspiring this collective, it'd be doing a disservice for what they took from as a whole. Because yes, Rose of Vesalius is very much an important and possibly core piece to the puzzle, 
But it wasn't the only thing that they drew inspiration from, as manga such as Candy Candy, Magical Princess Minky Momo, Magical Angel Creamy, and of course Sailor Moon, which Ikuhara was even a director from during its anime production, were all inspirations for this series. Ikuhara's direct inspiration for wanting to make Utena even directly came from his time working on the Sailor Moon anime, in which he wanted his next production to be one that quote, blew in the face of the prince fantasy. Potentially a remark made to counteract the relationship shown between Usagi and Mamoru in that series, but in reality, it was more of an overview on the state of the world in which Utena was made, in which he claimed that there was no longer a need for any setup where a girl is protected by a boy. As such, Utena was made as a response to that growing ideal that the world of anime and manga had grown past it with the rise of such series such as Sailor Moon, where the protagonists were shown to be more independent of their male counterparts, despite their more feminine traits. However, the Utena we know today didn't always follow that line of logic, as Utena the series went through several drafts during the time of its creation. In fact, one of the first drafts Ikuhara ever presented to the collective was during that January 1995 meeting, where they all came together for the first time, with the title of it being, and I'm not making this up, Chess Spawned Dragon Queen Utena! citing a metallic dragon on her chest that would come out during battle, of which Aguro basically said, It made no sense to me. There was even a draft of the franchise titled Revolutionary Girl Utena Kiss that had Utena the character being part of a quartet of heroes, Team Eleganza, alongside three others, Rod, Ruri, and Maya. You can kind of see where the inspirations of each member of the subsequent cast ended up spawning off from not just in the designs, but the comments made by Ikuhara when discussing them. But the pieces to the puzzle were there. Utena was the, or one of the many protagonists, and the mysterious end of the world were the antagonists to it. Even if it was a bit rocky getting there to the start, Ikuhara and the team knew what they were working with to start out, and for the next year and a half, the team would build upon Ikuhara's vision and add their own little bits to it as it went along. The idea that being set in a school such as Otori Academy was dead set early on into production, with a lot of the differing aspects that the series would be famous for, such as the Rose Bride concept, being added in the later stages of planning out the story as a whole. One notable person who contributed to the later concepts of it was Yoji Inakido, who worked beforehand on the screenplay for Evangelion prior to working on Utena, being the person on creative who brought the aspect of the duels into the series to begin with deciding that instead of having regular battles, that they be duelist instead. However, it wasn't all Inakino's idea to incorporate duels into the mix, as Chiho Saito had actually planted the seed for such an idea during the creative process, citing the Three Musketeers as a key inspiration. However, there was a feeling of it being more Takarazuka style during all of this as well, as the design process took a lot of its visual inspiration, especially in the costume design aspects from the all-female musical group Takarazuka Review. You can see their influences in a lot of the design choices that ended up coming into Utena's eventual final form as a series. This in turn separated it from its peers, alongside the overtly distinctive styles that it took from. Instead of having grandiose action-heavy battles and transformation scenes, it would be more subdued and in some ways transformative of the nature, citing the addition and subtraction mentality they went through during the creative process in which they subtracted aspects of the medium such as the transformations, evil organizations, and the aforementioned surefire attacks that came from the fights of the nature during that time. So, from New Year's 1995 to New Year's 1996, they all worked on getting it all put together, with the final product ready to be put into production throughout 1996, with a manga being made throughout the year. Its success spawning the anime we know and love being greenlit for a release in 1997, in conjunction with studio JC Staff. The anime studio, who had already had their hands full working on the third season of Slayers in that same anime core, had a tough job balancing two marginally different series throughout this anime season, and be Papas as well being their debut as a creative force. There was a lot of pressure on each party to get the best possible work out of this. But eventually, on that fateful April day, the curtain would rise for the very first time on the story we know today. Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a little princess, and she was very sad, for her mother and father had died. 
Our first look into the world of Usuna leads us in with the idea that this will be a similar to most shoujo anime of its time, by telling us a story of a princess and a prince, essentially setting us up with a literal storybook premise, complete with its notable rose-adorned borders and striking blackened imagery to convey what will eventually be a very oversimplified version of our story, but as an introduction, it does its job well. We are then introduced to the world of Atori Academy, where the series of almost in its entirety will be taking place. We're given a glimpse at Wakaba, a character who will be more important later on than she is now, and only a minute later, with fanfare and a confident stride, we're introduced to our protagonist, Miss Uchino Tenju. Her first interaction with a member of the teaching staff dressing her down for wearing the boys' outfit instead of wearing the women's outfit, a defined character trait of her design, as well as a clear statement to the viewer that while our protagonist might be the princess from that story, she sure as hell ain't no damsel. Men wanna be her, and women are fucking gay for her. But Utena is indifferent to all of them, including Wakaba, who is revealed as her best friend and might potentially have a major crush on her. But even then, there's nobody at the school that really catches Utena's eye. Save for one other. This is then we're introduced to Anfi Hememia, the eponymous Rose Bride of the episode. Within the confines of her signature Rose Garden, immediately catching Utina's attention to the degree that she hasn't given anyone up until this point in this part. And while her thoughts turn to the past due to the correlation of roses to it, there's obvious hints at something more being there with her fascination with Anfi. This fascination then turns into a need for direct action, as we're introduced to another character of importance, Sayurji, whose first act as an on-screen character is to assault Anfi, leading to the other members of the student council, mainly Toga Kiryu, to get involved. However, speaking of the council, we're quickly introduced to Juri and Mickey, as all four of them are introduced as members, or even subordinates of, End of the World. We are then also introduced to the basic premise of the Rose Seal, as well as the premise of the duels in question as Sayoji challenges them to duel him for Anfi, essentially setting up Anfi as a prize to be won instead of being engaged, as Toga puts it. Sayoji being displayed as an early season antagonist with his sleazy behavior towards Anfi and more or less treating her with disdain in front of the other council members, while Anfi submissively goes along with his comments. This, in turn, with comments made by Sayoji about a love letter placed in the main hall that was done by Wakaba and sent over to him. Him, spurred Uta into dueling him shortly thereafter, with the belief being that Utena is the new duelist mentioned by Toga previously. He accepts, advising Utena to join him in the dueling arena forest after school. Utena goes in, and is unsure about how to enter despite not having a key. Her rose signet ring ends up being the way to open up access to the arena, leading into our first iconic moment of the series, the ascent to the dueling arena. Well, I'd say this is an invitation. I think this is a good time as any to talk about the music in this series. In particular, the song you're listening to right now. Zetai Unmei Moku Shiroku, or Absolute Destiny Apocalypse, is essentially the prelude musical motif to all the duels in this series composed alongside the rest of the music in this series by Shinkichi Mitsumune and J.A. Caesar. Mitsumune worked primarily on the music you hear in the background on most of the scenes, while Caesar worked on the incidental songs that play during the dueling scenes, and the duality between the two is immaculate as Caesar basically sets the tone every time with his work, and aside from one piece in particular being used as an ending to the series later on, never has one particular song played twice in the series, meaning every song you hear in each duel is individually tailor-made to fit the themes and nuance of the story at the time. Absolute Destiny Apocalypse was even specifically used by Ikuhara during the process of selling Utena to potential studios, as it was believed that while the series was different, it didn't yet have that element that would make it stand out, and once Zum was playing on screen alongside its striking imagery of Utena climbing the seemingly never-ending staircase to the dueling grounds, that's when he knew that something was special here. The dueling arena itself is striking in its nature, with an upside down floating castle hanging above the arena itself, and seemingly being separated from everything else in the school. It seems so mystical the entire time, as if by design. 
Speaking of striking designs, this is the first we get to see of not only the Rosebride design of Anthe, whose unique clothing will become as iconic as the character design of Utena in the public zeitgeist, but also the first ever showing of the Sword of Dios being pulled from Anthe. Albeit a one and done by the current holder of the Rosebride, Sayonji, but it's a moment that will be forever cemented proper in episodes to come for its superbly unique method and the calling of it by its wielder. And then, of course, comes the duel itself. Armed with only a bamboo sword against the Sword of Dears, Utena takes on Sayonji while Anthe can only look on as the Rose Bride. The role of Utena as the prince and saving Anthe is implicated throughout this entire duel, and one may think that this is already a portrayal of the core idea of what Ikuhara wanted to do with this story, it serves the purpose of establishing the dynamics of Utena's early story. The duel as well, only lasting two minutes from the ringing of each bell to signify its beginning and end, establishes us not to expect massive battles of power and strength, but rather be a short moment in each episode as a character piece moment more than anything. As each duel presented seeks to be used more as a tool to move each character forward in a certain direction, rather than be used as a moment of intense action, which like the striking imagery of the arena itself, is by design. As such, Sayonji's loss in this duel is crippling to him, essentially having the main thing of his entire world be ripped from him, with Ampy's smile at Sayonji and a small little quip, You seem upset, Sayonji. Classmate. Signifying his crippling loss at the hands of Utena, who he deemed as nothing but a novice at the beginning. And with Utena leaving the arena as confused as the viewer might be to the whole affair we just witnessed, the reality creeps in that she may have placed herself in something much more than she bargained for, as Anthe now, as a part of winning the duel against Sionji, in her own words, now belongs to Utena. Now that was only just the first episode, and you can probably gather what you can expect from the premise of what we just seen, can't you? The piece was all laid out by B-Papas, and especially Ikuhara, are pretty much plain to see. But if you're a first time viewer, you may be wondering initially what all the commotion of a series that starts out like this is. To that I say, that's the point. You wouldn't exactly throw your audience into a deep end this early on and expect them to stick around for 38 more episodes, would you? No. You gotta lead them in slowly, which, for better or for worse, is what this and the following two episodes do in order to lead them into the universe at large, and let them know what they can expect from a series like this at its core. <coughs> Speaking of that second episode, however... For whom the Rose Smiles follows the events of the very next day following the duel between Utena and Sayonji, as well as the aftermath of Wakaba's rejection by Sayonji in the manner that spurned Utena to face him on that night before. With Wakaba in high spirits again, it seems all is well, but Utena is reminded of it all when Anthe shows up at her class's door. And then, we smash cut to another iconic piece of scenery. If it cannot break out of its shell, the chick will die without being born. We are the chick. The world is our egg. If we don't crack the world's shell, we will die without truly being born. Smash the world's shell. For the revolution of the world. The monologue they all share could be considered something a bit nonsensical to look into, especially given how vague and mysterious it is. Talking about a chick dying if it can't break out of its shell and whatnot. However, while it's an interesting piece of fury baiting about the series we'll get to look at down the road, it's worth noting that it's actually taken from a book by Herman Hess, which reads the following. The bird fights its way out of the egg. The egg is the world. Who would be born first must destroy a world. The bird flies to God. The God is Abraxas. Of course, that in and of itself doesn't provide much context, but knowing that Ikuhara looked to this kind of literature for inspiration shows the kind of mediums that would take it into account when creating the series lore. Still doesn't make it any less confusing on why it's used in such a way as this, however. Anyway, back to the main plot with Usna, having moved into one of the dorms on campus, finds to have moved herself into a room with Anthe as well. Only problem being that it's a single room. Which begs the question how two girls can sleep in a single together. In a bug bed, of course! 
Of course, this is also an explanation of another aspect of the Rose Bride, the sudden living arrangements being agreed upon term by those who have set up the duels, that being under the world as disclosed by the student castle earlier on. What follows is Utena basically saying to Anthony she never intended on being a duelist, primarily dueling Sayoji in order to stand up for Wakaba, and upon Sayoji returning to try and take Anthony back, with her outright telling him to just leave her alone. He reacts as expected. Spurning on Utena, Sayoji settles a rematch for Anfi, for which Utena openly proclaims she'll throw the duel in order to get out of the Rose Bride duels for good, obviously upsetting Anfi in the process. The rematch between Sayoji and Utena the following day being a more fair fight than previously, however showing a much more savage Sayoji in battle, and Utena being more subdued, almost ending up losing the duel as she said, until all of a sudden, a mysterious, white-haired spirit comes down, seemingly possessing Utena or granting her strength in order to deal the blow to Sayoji again. This raises another mystery into the equation of these early stages, that being the power of Deers mentioned by Toga as he watches off. That's making the audience ask what exactly the sword is capable of in the hands of someone like Utena, and why could someone like Sayoji not be able to do it if he was the one engaged to Anthe for so long? However, the status quo remains the same as the last episode regardless. Utena remains in the duels, and despite some interesting reasoning as to why she remains, that using Anfi's monkey, Choo Choo, as a reason to stay and fight for Anfi, showing that at least in some way, Utena isn't as flippant about her feelings regarding Anfi as she is for others around her in these early episodes. The relationship between Utena and Anfi is a bit tepid as a result of these early episodes, as Anfi as a character is treated less as an object of people to fight over and more of her own character as it goes on. Since, as we'll find out down the line, it isn't until Utena shows up that she's treated as such, showing at the end of the episode a genuine smile for the first time in the series. A rare sight, to be sure. This, however, places Utena in the position of being the prince to save Anfi from the duels and her fate as the Rose Bride. One may assume, based upon the continued aspect of Utena being in the duels and now having three more members of the student council to contend with in Jury, Mickey, and Toga, but it all comes in due time, as it seems to be more going on here than meets the eye. The following episode, On the Night of the Ball, goes into that idea a bit further with the blossoming relationship between Utena and Anthe, while also introducing a new character in the cast in Nanami Kiryu, the younger sister of Toga Kiryu. Speaking of Toga as well, this is the first time that him and Utena are introduced to each other properly, this interaction breeding a lot more down the line between the two of them, but it's her first introduction of someone in the student council outside of Sayurji. This will soon change, however, in the following episodes. The episode in question, however, this time is a more subdued effort than the past two. While they were made initially to set up the concept of the series at hand, this is more of an episode to be used in terms of building up more of a bond between our main pairing, while in Ikuhara's words, bringing the feeling of Miss Saito's manga into this, which explains the way that Toga and Utena interact with each other throughout this episode. Ikuhara even would state that episodes like this were necessary to convey the audience that, much like the episodes before it, it is still a shoujo anime at its core core, despite what later developments would come as a result. However, it's the moment at the end which I feel is the more important one to focus on at this period of time, as is the most close interaction between Utena and Anfi since she became Utena's Rose Bride, being saved by Utena once again in a princely fashion after a plot by Nanami is sprung, with the entire minutes long dance sequence between the two capping off this episode with the idea that there is potentially more there once again. But one has to wonder how long this will last, given the new complication of the mystery of Toga Kiryu as the question is now brought forward. Is he actually her prince from long ago? The next episodes to follow are focused on the other two members of the student council, as well as two separate Nanami episodes. I'll discuss the Nanami ones together after the fact, since, for technical reasons, they were both released out of schedule and production order, and therefore have errors of continuity in them when watching the show, and as we'll discuss in a later part, they are so divorced from the main plot of the show, they may as well exist in an alternate continuity altogether for a bunch of different reasons. So instead, let's start this off by discussing the two-part story revolving around Mickey, the Sunlit Garden, which drops us right at the duel between Utena and Mickey, citing his reasoning for wanting Anthea as the Rose Bride not for inherently machoistic reasons like Sionji, 
but because according to him, she is essentially a muse for his piano playing. See, this is a defining moment for Mickey, as up until this point, he was simply seen as the kid in the student council who did the stopwatch bit and was very smart. However, this two-parter shows us more of his character as someone who, while not instinctively a toxic male character in the show, did have some hints of selfishness in his character with his initial motivation. In fact, unlike Sionji's hostility towards her or Toga's subtle attempts at asserting power over her that was seen in previous three episodes, Mickey's tutoring of Utena prior to their duels feels like they could easily be friends to one another, if not for the two sides being at each other over Anfi. This fact duel carries on into the later part of the episode, where the three plus Nanami end up studying together, leading into a hilarious sequence of events which you've no doubt seen from this show, where Nanami plans to keep certain undesirable bugs or mammals in Enfi's belongings, and have her be seen as a weirdo according to Nanami. However, this backfires as Enfi actually keeps these regardless, and it's seen as a quirk of hers, showing as Ikuhara puts it, to have Enfi be seen as more fun. But getting back to the topic of Mickey's reasoning for dueling, it actually has equal parts to do with the title of the episode itself and the piece that plays throughout it. The Sunlight Garden is a song about the world you can never get back. The nostalgic world you can never return to. Ikuhara explains this as the meaning behind it, and it fits perfectly with the nature of its composer, Mickey, as he's trying to find the same inspiration he received when he was younger, playing with a mysterious figure, later revealed to be his sister. With Mickey's drive essentially coming from the fact that the twin sister will not play piano with him again, so his attempts to do so now fall upon Envy being his partner. But his passive nature makes it hard for him to do so, even calling for the student council to be dissolved due to a conversation him and Utena have in the first part about all the troubles the duels cause, which is a rightful point to bring up. However, it's only with some... how should I put this... forceful prodding on the part of Toga, as well as some prodding of his own on Anfi being able to do whatever the person she is engaged to tells her to do, he becomes determined to face Utena for Anfi to be his musical partner again, leading to their duel to cap off the two-parter. The duel itself is unlike either duel with Sionji at this point, with Mickey's style of fighting being more defensive, even complimenting Utena's style during their fight as Utena calls out Mickey's deluded mindset for wanting to free Anfi from Utena's control as the Rose Bride. Going back to his mindset not being instinctively malicious, but just as easily manipulative as the others have had until now. It's only when Anfi cheers for Utena, something she hasn't done in either duel up until this point, and seemingly a direct response to Mickey's cry that She's counting on me to save her! That's it, Miss Utena, get him! That he loses his focus and falters in the duel with Utena. His comments about dueling her again showing that, despite his loss, he has yet to lose his drive to gain Anfi as the Rose Bride deceptive of his well-mattered appearance as he states this. The next episode to focus on a member of the student council is Unfulfilled Jury, which, as you can guess from the title, is Toga's foray into the duels at last. No, of course, it's an episode on Jury, the only female member of the student council involved with the duels for Anvi. Our first introduction to her, however, is quite a depressing one, given the fact that it's starting us off with a quote of, You just have to give up, because there really are no such things as miracles. And then we're suddenly thrusted into the fencing class at Atori, where it's shown how much of a skilled fighter Jury is, and how, according to Mickey, nobody can beat her while Jury shows some obvious signs of not finding a lot to celebrate from being the best. Jury as a character, however, is shown to be your typical school prefect, as one would come to gather from the council by this point, as she's shown conversing with teachers about helping them out, in direct comparison to Utena being scolded for taking care of Chuchu while on campus at the very same scene. However, showing us a side into the other part of herself, she willingly diverts the teachers away in order to talk to Utena, leading to Utena talking her up as a big deal, for which Jury can only describe Describe the feeling as being seen as a wild animal, conflicting the two ideals of which they see Jury as. Also in the scene where the justification behind the student council dueling over Anfi is plainly stated to Utena for the first time, whoever has her as theirs will gain significant power, power we have bared witness to already in previous duels, and later it's told to us through Mickey and Toga that she wishes to battle for Anfi to disprove the idea of miracles. But it's a lot more than that. 
See, the complexity of Juri as a character is more than just someone who despises miracles or someone who wishes to use Andy for her own gain. Juri's saga in this series is more or less a story of unrequited love, and it's plainly shown to us within this and every episode featuring her moving forward. Believe in miracles, and they will know your feelings. To Juri, the concept of miracles correlates to her feelings of love towards someone in her life, these feelings manifesting in an abstract flashback of her, a boy, and a girl. The implication given to us at this point being that she took him away from Juri as an act of jealousy. We'll be coming back to this a fair bit as we see Juri a lot more, but this is an important moment to keep in mind since this is an unfighting character arc for Juri throughout the rest of the show. In fact, it's that same kind of background that causes her to lash out at Utena for declaring how she got into the duels to begin with, saying she should throw away her rose seal over such an ideal. Circling back around to the direct comparison between the two from earlier, as she, somewhat on the verge of her voice breaking, challenges Utena to show her the miracle and duel her. This duel shows another compliment to the previous duels, as Juri instantly shows the skill difference when it comes to dueling between her and Utena, except cutting deeper due to the knowledge Juri has of Utena's motivation. All the while, flashes at the moments we've seen play during pivotal moments at the end, both when Juri has Utena at a point where she can win, and at a point where Utena turns the tide with the power of Deers. Although almost not winning save for a betrayal of Juri's entire efforts, as a miracle literally saves Utena in this duel when her sword is thrusted into the air and then lands on Juri's rose right at the last second. And it's just as the episode ends, where everyone taunts Juri's belief over the miracles that saved Utena, that were revealed to the twist to Juri's story in the form of the locket that she keeps around her containing a picture. But not of the boy that she stole from her, but rather she herself, longing for not being able to tell her how she feels. Anyway, the next two episodes I want to discuss are the first one centered around Nanami as a character of focus. I mentioned before how these episodes in particular were essentially released out of production order due to them falling behind schedule in episode 8, which was meant to be episode 6, and vice versa. It's also worth noting that these specific episodes, as well as most other episodes with Nanami in them as a focal point, have several different aspects to them that don't fit with the rest of the series. They don't have duels in them, they played a lot more comedically driven compared to the more serious turn of the series. They show the characters outside of Atori Academy, which is a rare sight to be seen, and they're written by one person only, Ryota Yamaguchi, who is never officially a member of Bee Papas, and it's for this specific reason that all of his episodes feel very... off compared to the rest of the series. Take Care, Miss Nanami, as a first example, is centered around Nanami believing she's being targeted and someone is trying to kill her. And when disclosing it with Toga is met with a dismissive attitude to the whole thing, then after a comedically timed baseball to the face, she believes Utena to be the one behind the events happening. Obviously this is debunked quickly, but it's later met with another misinformed idea. As Toga and Anthe are seen together, the idea is that now Toga is the one behind it, and Anthe is the one to do it, complete with a seinen-esque betrayal scene in grayscale. Of course, once again, it's a misdirection, as Toga is wanting some bugs killed, and... Anthe is being... Well, being envy about it. It, however, leads into another near-death moment for Nanami, of which she's saved by a mysterious figure known as Mitsuru Suwabuki. Unsure of who he is, she comes to find out he's actually a middle schooler at Otori, propositioning him on a date when she finds out what? It's, it's alright, she basically ends up treating him like a butler and even a piece of furniture at one point. With everyone wondering how he could be okay with this kind of thing, with Sayoji basically spouting about love taking many different forms. Funny that, coming from an abusive piece of shit like him. However, it's revealed that Mitsuru actually met Nanami long ago when she was saved from a bull by Toga, with Mitsuru wanting to become like him in order to be something of a prince to Nanami. Of which Nanami outright rejects once it's revealed he did all of the acts to try and pull the same technique on her. The episode then ends with Mitsuru fighting a boxing kangaroo, and Nanami having to save Mitsuru and letting him stick around as more or less a subordinate, despite him wanting to be like Toger, 
a brother to Nanami. The next Nanami episode, Curried High Trip, starts us off with a cooking class of all things in a story featuring Utena and Anthe, which ends with them making a curry with ultra spicy magic curry powder it's instead of just ultra spicy 1000 regular curry powder. What a silly thing to do, right? All because Mickey wanted to eat a really spicy curry. <laughs> And the twist is that Utena and Anthe have now switched places due to the curry explosion, and wacky hijinks ensue with Utena and Anthe's body, and Anthe and Utena's! <laughs> I kid, but Utena and Anthe's body finally getting back at the trio always with Nanami is such a satisfying moment because in these early episodes, Anthe getting slapped is almost such a common occurrence, it's like you're not really watching Utena if you don't see it happen. That being said, Nanami relents and reveals she was the one who did the deed, and travels off to India in order to get the same curry powder to undo the switcheroo, causing her to get into so many funny moments of pain in the process. Meanwhile, a subplot involving Uta Nanfi and Sayoji occurs, wherein Sayoji's exchange diary with Anthe, which was his at and take care, is shown off, with Uta having a conflict of interest given that Anthe is meant to brighten it, but is currently in her body. However, Anthe Utena is advising her to write it as though she's her, leading to Utena reading it and becoming less than enthused at the contents of it, to say the least. Nanami returns with the spice and promptly gets trampled by an elephant. Utena laments living the rest of her life as Anfi, and Anf Utena arrives with curry, with it being revealed to not be magic curry, but Anfi's cooking being so ridiculous she could just. Switch bodies with whoever eats it? You see what I mean about these episodes being really weird and divorced from the rest of the series in nature that they feel like you're watching an entirely different show? According to reports, Yamaguchi was told absolutely nothing about the actual plot of the show when writing these, hence the tonal shift whenever he writes one of these episodes but it doesn't mean they're not without merit. Take Care actually works if you watch it right before episodes 9 and onwards, as it works as a comparison piece for Toga as a character compared to Mitsuru, who essentially acts as a foil to him in the episode as a more comedic tone, which sets him up for the following episodes where he takes center stage more prominently. And Curried High Trip works well as a companion piece for the early episodes with Sayoji, essentially still not being over Anthe, and Anthe being too nice, undeservedly so, to Sayoji to continue up with the exchange diary, showing his control over Anthe continues in some small ways, despite him no longer being engaged to her. Something of which will be brought upon in the following episodes as well to bring this first arc full circle. So, while not exactly the most thrilling or character-driven of plots, in fact some of Yamaguchi's episodes later become the most inane episodes of the series, these early two serve to kind of sprinkle some additional parts into the story into these episodes that otherwise would have been just been left as filler. I wouldn't get used to it however since not all Nanami episodes are alike in nature, but we'll get to that eventually. Now, at this point, I feel like we need to take a bit of a step back to really look at the story in front of us. As, for better or for worse, we've been introduced to the majority of our main recurring cast for the duration of this series. Utena and Anvi as our protagonists, with Kama and Chuchu as their sidekicks, the student council, Sayonji, Toga, Miki, Juri, and Toga's little sister, Nanami. All nine of these characters will continue to appear in one shape or another throughout the remainder of this series, and for the most part of the, in this series, the majority of their plots and story beats have been introduced to us through these individual episodes by this point. Miki with his search for a muse, Juri with her longing for a love that can never be, Sayonji being an abusive manipulative prick, Toga being some kind of a prince and asserting his power at points to the council, and Utena, and Nanami is just doing her own thing, I guess. While Utena is searching for her prince and while, in a sense, protecting Anvi from those that wish to use her for malicious purposes. All the while, Wakaba and Chuchu cheer them on from the sidelines, which, in these early episodes, happens a lot. That being said, however, while we have all these pieces laid out for us, for all of them and their narratives, as we saw with Jury, there's a lot more hiding in all of this than seems to be through the train viewer's eyes. So let's break this down the only way we know how. With a pinboard! 
Okay, so we have our 9-bit players on this board here, no problem so far. You're probably thinking to yourself, Chloe, how is this complex? There's like 9 people on here at the moment. But see, that's where you're wrong, because it's not 9 people to start us off with. It's actually 15. Because yes, you have the 9 named characters that we talked about in our focal points, but you also have to add Bootinous Prince, End of the World, Mickey's sister, he and she from Jury's episode, and also a Tory Academy itself. Trust me on that last one, it'll make a lot more sense by the end of this. But yes, we have 15 characters to discuss in terms of complexities with each other and how important they are to the bigger picture. So let's start off with the easy ones by segmenting Usuna, Anthe, and Wakaba and Chu Chu off into our own little group. The steering council into their own and put End of the World with them, and he and she on the outside near Jury, and finally the prince near Utena and Atori Academy right in the middle. Now the easy relationship here is with Uta and Anthe as the hero duo dynamic with some sexual tension in the mix, Anfi and Choo Choo as platonic best friends, Utena and Wakaba as besties with additional sexual tension on Wakaba's end, and Utena and the Prince as a kind of parasocial relationship. Nanami and Toga are siblings, so that's an easy one to get put together, as well as Mickey and his sister. Jury with he and she are former friends and one crush that Jury is yearning seemingly endlessly, and all five of them are tied together to end of the world as subordinates. Not bad now, sure, but this is where things get a little bit messy. See, there's implications that Toga and the Prince are actually one and the same early on in the series, so Toga's relationship with Utena is one based around asserting that ideal upon her, something of which is about to get delved on a lot in the coming episodes. So we'll just say that this is pre-romantic gaslighting on his part. At the same time, Anfi and Sionji have a very weird dynamic as establishing Curried High Trip with the Exchange Diary, showing that Anfi still has him in her life to some degree, but it's shown to be a one-sided affair with Sionji believing he'll get her back one day, and Anfi not really caring for the idea. We'll say this is an unrequited abuser versus partner free from abuse relationship. Alongside that, there's hints of a somewhat complicated history between Sionji and Toga. We'll temporarily say that this is a strained friendship at best, and revisit this at some point. There's also a weird relationship going on between Mickey's sister and Toga, as we saw in the Sunlit Garden two-parter. I'm gonna call this tepid friends with benefits to egg somebody on and leave it there. As well as that, however, aside from Sionji, every other member of the student council has a relationship with Anfi as the Rose Bride. Mickey wants to use Anfi as his muse for piano playing, but Anfi doesn't reciprocate this. I'm gonna call this one-sided minor gaslighting of ideals. Jury wants to use her as an example of her stubborn ideals of miracles not existing. I'm gonna call this one basic lesbian denial. And finally, Toga's relationship with Anfi is wanting power for power's sake and doing anything to obtain it. This is simply abuse in of and the name of power. And finally, Atori Academy is related to everyone except, except Nanami because it is a hellscape for which they cannot leave. Yeah, I know it looks bad, but trust me, eventually it's going to get even worse than what you're seeing right now. So we'll just leave this for now, but if you think that that was bad, just wait till we get to the end because it will get so much worse. Moving right along here, however, we enter episode 9, The Castle Said to Hold Eternity. The episode starting off with Sionji and Togo dueling each other in a typical kendo fashion, instead of the Rosebride duels we've become accustomed to after several episodes. This establishes two things to start us off, one being the relationship the Sionji and Togo have, as we've hinted at previously being seen as more than just members of the student council, but more of them being friends for longer than most people in the series have probably known each other for. 
It's also here where it's basically established Siren G sees Toga as his rival, with his determination to obtain Anfi as a Rose Bride again being a way for him to surpass Toga and pursue something eternal. This then leads us to the second part of this episode's meaning, as it not only establishes more Siren G as a character and his relationship to Toga, but also establishes something that we haven't seen yet. The real events of what happened at the funeral of Utena's parents. <laughs> And to the story's credit, it's a complete tonal whiplash from what Utena has been basically telling us up until this point, more or less showing us the truth compared to the more storybook one established earlier, as it shows Toga and Sironji finding a younger Utena in a coffin next to her parents, the implication being that she's wanting to be buried alongside them instead of go on living. That is, however, until Toga comes along to cheer her up, even giving us this little line as well. You can trust me. I'm an ally to all women. We'll be coming back to this line for sure. Regardless, this part of the episode establishes two key factors that lead into things that have either been implied early on, or begin to be seen more with this. The first one is obvious. Toga is heavily implied by this point in the story to be the prince that Uta has talked about at the funeral. With the little hints that he's shown up until this point in other episodes being smaller ones, this is one in which can easily be shown as the biggest confirmation by all points that Toga and the prince are one and the same. The second one is a bit more below the surface of what we've seen till now. Utena being seen as an unreliable narrator. The entire point of her storybook-like opening has been to show that this is what she remembers from that time frame, as well as being used as a framing device. But this is the first true instance of her perspective of things being a bit fractured, as this comes to a shock as first-time audience members due to the continued use of this framing device for her background as the story moves on. But now we know that there's more to it, this is where we first ask ourselves. How much of the Prince story is actually true? The two factors collide with each other during the second act of this episode, as Toga takes advantage of the information that Utena met a prince when she was younger to try and coerce Utena into believing he's her prince. I'm an ally to all women. What follows, however, is an interesting bit involving Sayoji, as after being told by End of the World that the castle in the dueling arena is set to come crashing down, was shown that Sayoji has taken Anfi by force to the dueling arena, Utena arriving to find Sayoji collapsed and confused on where Anfi is and why the dueling arena is open to begin with. It's then that we find Anfi in a coffin similar to the one that Utena was shown in in the flashbacks from earlier, but a lot more elaborate, as Utena initially goes for a PS1 platforming segment in order to save her from said coffin, Sayoji is ready to be shown eternity as the castle begins to fall down above him. However, what he's given instead is the castle literally falling on top of him, the dueling arena collapsing entirely, and none of that actually happened. What happens instead is Sayoji going mad with the realization he was duped and going to take it out on Utena instead. That is until Toga comes to take the blow, once again teasing Utena with the idea that he's actually her prince still. Which is then followed by what appears to be a phone call between Toga and End of the World. The phone call concludes that Sayoji's letter was planted by Toga, he's being expelled as part of his actions on Toga, and that his friendship with Sayoji may be a lot more hollow than what we may have seen to this point. Either way, Toga has played his hand successfully in his long game for the Rose Bride, and it's only a matter of time until we see it come to fruition. This is immediately followed up on in the opening moments of the episode, Nanami's Precious Fig, where the remaining student council members denounce Sayonji, all the while Toga proceeds to continue his way to the top by gaslighting, gatekeeping, and mail bossing, oh, and burning Sayonji's exchange diary with Anfi when asked to take good care of it by him. What a cunt! But aside from that, this episode is primarily focused on one final duelist entering the fray before Toga, and that's everyone's favorite girl, Nanami. Yes, we do have a Nanami-focused episode that isn't treated as filler and actually showcases the dynamic between the two Kiryu siblings in an interesting manner, where the relationship between them is seen as akin to more one-sided incestual love in a way, as their interactions in this episode are anything to go by. However, it's tied into a plot with Anfi getting a kitten as a birthday gift to Toga, mirroring an event that took place in Nanami and Toga's childhood, where Nanami got a kitten for him. Thus, you can imagine what happens next. Nanami gets upset, causes a kerfuffle about it, and is sworn in as a duelist by Toga via End of the World to duel her. All in like, 
two minutes roughly. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, this one is more rushed in pace compared to the rest of the episodes, especially the duel which doesn't even last that long over a minute since it's still tied into the Toga plotline from last episode. Which admittedly is a shame because Nanami being given an episode not written by Yamaguchi is a blessing when it happens, but it's kind of sad she gets shafted like this in just being another stepping stone in the final part of the student council saga, alongside Toga once again planting a seed in Utena's head to make her think he is her prince. This all comes to fruition in the following episode, Gracefully Cruel, the one who picks that flower, where after several episodes of hinting at it, we finally get the Utena and Toga duel, while the rest of the episode before it is set up for it in establishing Utena's wavering resolve to, in the face of Toga challenging her, and also declaring to be her prince. However, her continued devotion to making sure Anfi isn't being used as another Rose Bride by someone else seems to not be enough, as even with the power of Dios manifesting in her, his indoctrination to make her believe he's her prince is enough to make her completely falter even at the crucial moment where she could have ended it. Thus, this leads to Uta's first loss in the duels, Toga leaving with Anfi and confirming the sentiment that the Rose Pride simply does whatever they are told to by the person who is engaged to them. I'm an ally to all women. Making Utena believe that whatever she had been trying to get through to Anfi was for naught, leaving Utena in the dueling arena alone. For friendship, perhaps, picks up immediately in the aftermath of this, with Utena becoming depressed over the events of losing the duel against Toga, missing the following day's class, and even tearing out her uniform in supposed anger. Thus, for the only time in the series, Utena wears the standard Atori girl's uniform to the academy, her face looking not exactly happy with this, and her voice lacking the standard bravado that she used to carry. It seems that losing against Toga has snuffed out whatever fire was inside Utena to this point. Even seeing Anfi as a student, instead of her being the Rose Bride, continues to make her spiral down further, and it's worsened when Toga appears once more, as if to taunt Utena over her change in I'm attitude and uniform. The only one really to try and get through to Utena during all of this is Wakaba, who diligently gets at Utena the entire time over her spiral down to depression caused so suddenly, and made worse by Toga's continued existence in her life causing her misery. Eventually, she does get through to her, but it does raise something that has basically been seen this entire arc. See, up until now, we've seen Utsuna as this cool, confident tomboy who's been trying to be like her idealized hero, the prince. Since she spent so long trying to wait for him, she basically spent her entire life up until this point in the story following along with what a heteronormative society would deem a prince to be. Athletic, charming, stoic to the point of ambivalent to those around her, and even coming to the aid of a damsel in distress in the form of Wakaba as her friend being humiliated, and later Anfi as the abused Rose Bride after she, she accepts that yes, she does in fact wish to keep being her protector, in a sense, from those that seek to use her for their own gain. She even confirmed to the jury that most of what she's doing in her day-to-day -day actions is because of the prince's involvement in her life during such a traumatic moment for her. That she's not only looked up to him as some form of role model as a result of it, but is also still desiring him as well. So of course, once her prince has supposedly shown himself in the form of Toga manipulating her into believing as such, through his actions from as soon as episode 3, it's been clear his intent was always to use this to his advantage, lower Utena's guard down and take Anfi for himself. But to Utena, it's like she's been betrayed by everything in her life. This wasn't even an immediate thing either, as even in episode 10, she was seen solemnly lamenting the idea of her being a prince, even muttering to herself, Maybe a girl really can't become a prince. That was the chink in her armor. Toga got there and took advantage of it fully with his implanting of being her prince at every turn, making Utena doubt everything she had known and then torching it. So it's no wonder she ended up this way in the end, given that her believed Prince Toga had showed her the truth that she wasn't a prince, she couldn't save Anfi, and she couldn't even stand up for herself when it counted. So in her mind, what was the use of continuing with her facade of being a prince herself if the person she believed as her prince had struck down every ideal she had? And so she returns to what is deemed normal for her. 
a more submissive attitude, wearing feminine clothing as a default, and becoming more of what is expected by a society of women to be. Until she's reminded of what she fought for in the first place that kept her going. Not the prince that she modeled herself after, but the ideals behind it and doing what is right for those who matter most. Utena's journey in this arc is one of her reaffirming her values in being the prince she so looked up to. Not bowing down to the ideals of modern heteronormative society when challenged by the status quo, and embracing who she is and who she fights for when faced with adversity. It's one of the defiance of growing up around hetero society which blinds girls into their own sense of identity and self-worth, and focus more on getting a husband or prince to fall in love with, and becoming a part of what society wishes for them to be as a result, submissive and not thinking for oneself. But Utena's continued journey and defiance of that ideal is basically her saying, fuck patriarchal stereotypes and fuck you, I'm my own prince. And all of that comes to the forefront in this episode and the Student Council Saga's climactic duel. Armed with a sword given to her by Juri, as a sign of respect but to the two of them as she realizes what Utena is fighting for is similar to her own now, Utena squares up against Turga, armed with the added power given to the Sword of Dears by Anthe as a show of how much he knows of its power. The duel, in parallel to their first battle last episode, sees Utena more on the attack despite Toga's continued outmatching of her, even breaking the sword using its enhanced blade, tearing apart at Utena's standard school outfit in the process as he attempts to get at her again verbally. However, despite all of the handicaps and verbal disses at her, she continues to fight on to get back to what she once was as well as Anvi who, throughout this entire thing, is basically wanting for Utena to stop for fear she'll be hurt as a result. But, as she realizes that this mirror is the first time she dueled Sayurji, the same determination that she had for Wakaba's honor being shown for her safety, Anfi's power over the Sword of Deers fades away, as if powered by her own will. And with one determined strike, Utena slices at Toga's rose, defeating her supposed prince, as well as reaffirming herself as who she is, her own prince, and Anfi's protector against those that would seek to use her for their own gain as a part of the duels, thus ending the Student Council Saga. At least for the most part, anyway. See, bridging the gap between this and the next saga is tracing a path, showing the aftermath of Toga following his second duel with Utena, having fallen into his own depression, sitting in a chair as it replays the chick speech that would normally play during the elevator ascent over and over on a loop. All the while, a mysterious purple-haired man ascends into the floating castle in the dueling arena, meeting another similarly-haired man, implied to be Dears, as they run through each duel that is passed in the Student Council saga till now and specifying their meanings, as well as giving some insight to the audience on why the power is manifested for Utena and not others. With each duel in the series being titled for its theme, the two Sionji duels being friendship and choice respectively, Mickey's being reason, Juries for love, Nanami's for adoration, and finally, the two Toga duels as being for conviction and self. With the two going back and forth on each other, there's said to be a chance that Utena might reach to the door called Revolution, which, given this series title, would be very fitting, and that both of them will benefit from it, implying the relationship between this man and Dears being one which seeks to obtain something from Utena, being the one to revolutionize the world. While one may look at this as being a heavy-handed way to explain to the audience the meanings behind their character arcs and what each part of this arc has meant by this point, it does give us some confirmation behind certain relationships and narrative structures, given, giving us no uncertainty as to where we stand on each of these battles and what they mean. And as a pink rose falls to the ground, then surrounded by several black roses, the man in a red shirt walks away into a silhouette, greeted by someone who looks like Anfi, as we cut to Utena and Anfi's dorm, Anfi returning and distracting Utena upon her asking of where Anfi was, as if to hide it. Several flashes of scenes are shown, two key images of being of a black rose cultivating in a black room, in a black rose crest ring, followed by an image of several boys in Notori Academy, and the regular to-be-continued message changed to Absolute Destiny Apocalypse. One chapter ends, but another one with more adverse challenges 
is about to begin.